Chris. Thank you. So I'm from New Orleans, and so I guess I'm kind of like the water boy, and I might be the only guy up here that could pass the test, as they said. So thank you for showing us that therapeutic bloodletting, Joe. We're going to talk about a little different way to approach things. So my disclosures are, are listed here, and also Dr. Boileau and Dr. Hatsidakis, who con contributed to the talk, helped design the implant I'm going to present. So what's wrong with the treatment of proximal humerus fractures? Well, you can look at these two guys and think about what's wrong with them. So we're going to go forward. You know, uh, we've discussed something like percutaneous pinning. This can be the ideal scenario for some people and for challenging patients like this 62-year-old smoker. It is doable, but it is hard, and it does require a second operation to remove those annoying pins. So what about plating? Well, the issues with plating are that it's humeral head-based fixation. You do not get tuberosity fixation, or if you do, it's very poor. And the screws are parallel to the plane of the fracture of the tuberosities. They may capture the head, but again, they're parallel to the tuberosities. And what we le all learn from original AO biomechanics is that you really should be perpendicular to your fracture line if you want to get stable fixation. The other thing, as uh, Joe so elegantly showed, it can be very uh, devascularizing, to say the, uh, the least, and that increases your risk of AVN, especially when you go breaking apart all the callus. So with three and four part fractures, you could try and do something percutaneously, but that can be challenging when you're plating, and there are high complication rates. So when we go around playing doctor, we can very often end up as a loser, at least our patient can. So what's wrong with current IM nail designs? Well, Joe did point some of this out. Nails are too big or too long, and those can serve as non-union machines. They're not centered in the diaphysis, and that can lead to malunion, which is still fairly well tolerated in the humerus. And the proximal bend equates very often to a large rotator cuff tear that's certainly not going to heal over metal. And if you have only humeral head-based fixation, well, the tuberosities are going to migrate, the head will collapse, and then you're just going to sit there and erode the glenoid. And if you have no locking mechanism proximally, then the screws are just going to fall out. So current IM nail designs, they were humeral head-based fixation, and this led to tuberosity migration, and tuberosity migration, of course, leads to pseudoparalysis and poor outcomes. So current nails did not approach the greater tuberosities. You did not get tuberosity head fixation. However, nails should not be utilized like hip nails because the proximal humerus is not the hip and the forces that deform the fractures are very different. So what is the worst complication that you can get for patients with three and four part fractures? Is it humeral head necrosis? Well, several studies, and I'm not going to bore you with the science, uh, do not really show that humeral head necrosis is a problem, but greater tuberosity migration is. And basically, hemiarthroplasty is the ultimate AVN, but what happens when it's executed poorly is you have something that may look pretty on an x-ray, but it's kind of non-functional, and it just sticks out there. So many hemis, unfortunately, are losers as well. So. What is new in the uh, aqualis humeral nail? Well, instead of head-only fixation, it is tuberosity fixation with head support. The fracture line is treated by having screws that go perpendicular to the tuberosity fragments, and the head is supported with these. The nail is short and straight, so it respects the humeral head offset, and it doesn't violate the supraspinatus tendon. And you do get locking fixation into the tuberosities, again, with head support. The screws, in fact, lock into a bushing in the nail rather than into bone. And distally, you have divergent screws that help center the nail in the shaft of the humerus and also reduce the micromotion. So you do have a very stable implant. So I don't always nail, but when I do, I use an aqualis nail. So you can also do this percutaneously so you don't violate the soft tissues. And if you're going with a varus displacement fragment, then you can use a posterior approach through an advisor style portal. If you have more valgus displacement, you can use an anterior portal. And so this is just an example of those various approaches here. So with three and four part fractures, even if you need to, you can use an open approach, which in this case we would prefer to use a superior approach. And you basically resect a small bony fragment anteriorly and reflect the deltoid through the front of the wound. And this way you can get down, do the appropriate reduction. So first you want to derotate the diaphysis, you want to elevate the humeral head, and then you want to close the book, bring the tuberosities together underneath the humeral head. And bone grafting may not be necessary. And then you can provisionally stabilize it and introduce your nail percutaneously. And here are a couple of examples. 
of the uh, outcomes and functions, and this can even work in young active patients. So the take-home messages here, you do have some bio, uh, excuse me, biological advantages by going percutaneously with the nails and biomechanical advantages with the newer designs. And again, more examples of this, you don't necessarily need massive head support to get a good outcome. Also, I would recommend you place patients in a derotation brace to reduce the forces on the humerus, and so you get the benefits of pinning as well as some of the benefits of plating. Here's a quick case example as well. And lastly, I'm just going to run into a very quick little video just showing the approach in one of my cases. So here we basically don't get the video to run. All right, so new concept. It's a short, straight nail, locked screws, minimal soft tissue disruption, a percutaneous approach. You get all the advantages of percutaneous and locking constructs.